Hi, this is Brian Dolan with the law firm Pepper Hamilton. Each month, Pepper partner Greg Novak hosts a webinar for West Legal Ed Center, which focuses on issues that are affecting private funds and their managers. You can download a copy of the PowerPoint slides that the presenters went through by visiting Pepper's Insight Center at www.pepperlaw.com, where this podcast is posted. Thank you. This is Gregory Novak from Pepper Hamilton. I'm a partner in the New York and Philadelphia offices of the firm. We're a full-service law firm um, looking out for all of your legal needs. Today I'm joined with uh, two of my colleagues from Pepper Hamilton, uh, Paul Peretta and Kate Winslow, and then um, two distinguished guests, Frederick Way from Barclays and Rich Giuliano, Chief Operating Officer of Emerald Asset Management. So, Kate, tell us a little bit about yourself. Ladies first. <laughs> Kate Winslow, I'm in the Philadelphia office of Pepper Hamilton, and uh, I focus most of my work on executive compensation, employee benefits, which includes both deferred comp, non qualified deferred comp, and qualified plans. Paul? Thank you, Greg. My name is Paul Peretta. I'm a partner in the New York office of Pepper Hamilton. I also specialize in executive compensation and employee benefits, do quite a lot of work with 401k plans and employee stock ownership plans. Also known as ESOPs, which will be part of our topic of conversation today. Uh, Rich Giuliano. Thanks, Greg. I'm Rich Giuliano. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Emerald Asset Management, an institutional money manager located in Pennsylvania. I specialize in paying legal fees to our friends at the table today. Uh, (laughs) And... uh, we have just uh, done a transaction, and we are uh, we were a 100% employee-owned company. And Fred. Thanks, Greg. Uh, my name is Frederick Way. I'm a director in, uh, at Barclays Capital, uh, working inside of our financial institutions group, specializing in covering asset managers. Uh, I've been doing it for uh, about 11 years now. Um, uh, we cover asset management companies from here in New York. Uh, but do so globally. Okay, well, thank you all. And our topic today is exit strategies for the asset management firm. <clears throat> and uh, what you'll see as we go through the discussion is we have a unique take on what is meant by an exit strategy. It could be an exit strategy for an individual. It could be an exit strategy for the entire management team. It could be a restructuring of the firm. It could be a self-sale, where, in effect, you turn the firm into an employee-owned firm, as Emerald did a few years ago by installing an employee stock ownership plan. So we're going to start off with an overview of compensatory equity. And I'm going to ask Kate to sort of walk us through uh, a general description of what do we mean by compensatory equity. So generally, compensatory equity is equity given to employees for services rendered to the employer. Um, you're not subject to the carried interest exception. You're not giving compensatory equity to um, kind of investments. It's sweat equity. Um, so particularly focusing on an LLC, um, there are essential or tax or entity in general. You're looking at profits interests or capital interests. Those are your two basic compensatory uh, uh, routes in a pass-through entity. So uh, picking up on my long ago history as a tax lawyer, um, it used to be if I gave someone property as compensation for services rendered, they'd have taxable income. Sure. Now, if I put restrictions on that property that say it's not vested or uh, it reverts to the company at book value, then they don't have a tax incidence until those restrictions lapse, Mm -hmm. right? But if I give someone a partnership interest as compensation, that's not treated in the same way as stock, correct? It, there's no need to value it today, even though it is a grant property. Now, why the distinction? Well, it depends on which interest you're, you're granting at that point, but if you were to give a capital interest, that would be taxable, as it does have technically a, a value on day one, a capital account. So I have to look at what would happen if I turned around and sold the interest. Correct, yeah. So if I sold the interest, then I would get zero because it was truly based on future sure. appreciation, mm-hmm. then there's no taxable event. That's correct. Well, there's a taxable event, but it's zero. Which one is it? That is, that is correct. So it's, it's, the IRS has said that a profit interest, which is an interest in the future profits of the, the entity, um, if structured correctly, is not a taxable event. Um, uh, sometimes we will make prophylactic 83B elections just in case it doesn't meet the structure. And at that point, you have a tax, you potentially have a taxable event, which is zero. 
But what's an, what's an 83B election? It, oddly enough, says um, I want to be taxed instead of when the property vests. I want to be taxed at grant, which when you are um, granted profits interest, you can actually, you are not taxed until the, the actual property vests. Now, why would you accelerate the taxation of anything? Because the value on day one is hopefully going to be the lowest number, the, the lowest value of that interest you're going to grow. Um, and so if you are taxed at zero at ordinary income rates on day one, but you are taxed at long-term, hopefully, cap capital gains rates on the appreciation, it's a much better uh, tax vehicle for the employee. So in contrast to a stock option, where you don't get any equity value and where the increase in value is going to be ordinary, generally? Generally, yeah. So here there's the possibility that while the income attributable to the ownership of the LLC interest, the partnership interest, would be ordinary going on, mm -hmm. if, the, if the partnership interest gives you a right to share in the enterprise value mm -hmm. at some later point in time, that may be capital gain is what you're telling me. Correct. If, if, like I said, if structured correctly and if not structured correctly but an 83B election is made, that is essentially the treatment. So if you look at slide six, those of you who are following along with the materials, we have one, two, three, four, five different types of equity that, that Caitlin has identified here. We have restricted stock, non-qualified stock options, capital interest, profits interest, and carried interests. So what's the difference between, I think we talked about the first three, what's the difference between a profits interest and a carried interest? So carried interest is essentially a type of profits interest that the IRS has said it gets even more preferential treatment uh, than even profits interest do. So it, it needs to be, um, it's essentially a uh, interest in the actual uh, excuse me, the profits in the, the fund, excuse me. So it's a profits interest in that the award of the interest shares in future profits of the actual fund. Um, but it is specifically awarded to um, GPs in a private equity fund. It's specifically limited to investment type of, of vehicles. Um, so as you will note, the, the new tax law has made some changes. Yeah, so let's talk about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. This is slide seven for those following along. Um, you know, leading up to that, uh, in the fall of 2017, there was a lot of fear that carried interest would be all of a sudden considered ordinary income. Now, putting this in context, the um, IRS went after these types of things about 30 years ago in the um, Sol Diamond case. And then after that, it was like 15 years, and they went after it again in the Campbell case. And then it took another 15 years, and all of this hubbub about whether or not carried interest should be taxed as ordinary income. Now, if you own property, someone grants you property, where you buy that property, the fact that you used your services for which you've been taxed, you know, the compensation you receive for your services for which you've been taxed, once you buy the property, why would not the future appreciation be capital, right? That's the theory. However, when you look at some of the quote-unquote profits derived by private equity and hedge fund managers over the years, uh, you saw tax regulators and more importantly people who run public pension plans and others saying, wait a minute, that's a lot of compensation to be given to someone simply because they went along for the ride. Now, it's an asymmetrical compensation return, remember. Um, they only make money if there's money to be made. If the value of the investment does not go up, they get nothing. Correct. And so the risk profile of that, in my view, takes it out of a compensatory uh, characterization, and what you really have is a lot of sour grapes. But I'm editorializing. So what did the Tax Cut and Jobs Act do? Um, so essentially, it, and to sum it up in one sentence, it increased the holding period um, for the applicable partnership interest um, to receive long-term capital gains treatment from one year to three years, meaning that if you are holding this applicable partnership interest in this applicable trade or business um, and you dispose of that interest within one year, two year, two and a half years, 
you're not going to receive as you would have previously a long-term capital gains treatment. But what constitutes disposition? Okay, think about it this way. I own a carried interest in a fund. The fund owns 20 different assets, sure. properties. Yeah. Um, normally, as each of those properties is sold, there's going to be a gain or loss recognized by the fund. Mm -hmm. I still hold my profits interest, but is that gain going to flow through to me as capital, or is it going to flow through to me as ordinary until I hit the three-year holding period? So it's... It, and that's kind of where the regulations have been a little unclear. Is the interest that you're counting the, the holding period for, the actual interest of in the partnership, is it the actual asset that has been disposed of by the partnership as a whole? Um, essentially, people in the industry have, have stated that it's likely that as long as the partnership interest is held for three years, you can get long-term capital gains treatment on an asset that is sold in under that with that holding period, however, that's still unclear. And of course, um, this is talking about the federal taxation of it. Many states piggyback off of federal tax treatment, so if it's income for federal purpose, it becomes income per state. Mm -hmm. Other states like Pennsylvania has a different rule with a complete independent definition of what is income and what is not income. And so obviously, uh, those who have carried interest after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act this is the first year that it was effective, right, 2018? That's correct. So filing positions are going to have to be taken beginning in January of 2019 with respect to the filings you're doing for 2018. So it'll be a very interesting spring, it seems to me, as we try to parse out the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Absolutely. Um, so toggling from the compensation component, let's talk about a more organized way for investors, or excuse me, managers to participate in the value of their firm. Um, they could do that, I'm assuming, through non-compensatory um, grants of equity, or if, you know, the, the owner of the firm could parcel out pieces of equity, and as uh, Rick is going to talk about later with respect to the OZ transaction. But um, a more organized way to do that is an ESOP. So, Paul, tell us about ESOPs and how they work. Thank you. So, uh, certainly, an ESOP can be used as a you know, tool of corporate finance and, and may be an integral part of an exit strategy for asset managers or asset management company. But you've got to start at the definition of an ESOP and an, an explanation of what it actually represents. So, an ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan. That's a term that comes right out of the Internal Revenue Code, and it's a tax-qualified retirement plan uh, that's designed to invest primarily in qualifying employer security. All right, so let's take a time out there. We've got a lot of terms of art yeah. there. Okay, first of all, the ESOP is governed by the tax code. And it's, Correct. It's a re qualified retirement plan just like a defined benefit plan or just like a 401k plan. Correct. It actually is a defined contribution plan. retirement plan, and not only is it subject to uh, numerous requirements under the Internal Revenue Code, as an employee benefit plan, it's also subject to ERISA. Okay. So we're talking Department of Labor rules, non-discrimination rules, participation, limitations, all of those things that would normally be considered part of a normal retirement plan administration. Right. And, and something here. to bear in mind, if I may interject, it's not only uh, extensive IRS and Department of Labor rules, but also what is often extensive IRS and Department of Labor scrutiny. And, and uh, so oh, I thought you were going to say lure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the law and the lure, but go ahead. Yes, yes. And, and so, you know, another important aspect of this to bear in mind at the outset is that the, uh, the a company forming an ESOP is going to have certain fiduciary duties and responsibilities that will have to be uh, uh, looked at carefully throughout the process. So I'm going to t turn to Rich here for a second. Rich, you've lived this, right, as the okay. chief operating officer of a company that has an ESOP. Um, tell us about how difficult it is. Is it going to change your life, or is it something that is relatively easily managed? Well, it's like any plan you put in place. Initially, there's time and effort to adopting the plan and getting things up and running, but after the initial thrust, 
you, you have the same requirements. You have to file 5500 like you do with your 401k plan. You have to do a highly comp test. You have the only difference here, you have to get an outside valuation done. But the reality is it's not that hard to manage uh, once it's up and running. So let's talk about the benefits of an ESOP. Uh, yeah, Paul. So, um, uh, you know, bear in mind that an ESOP can be formed by a public company or a non-public company. It can be formed by a C corporation or an S corporation. But today I think we'll focus on how it works for non-public companies and in particular for an S corporation. Now, Rich, that's what you have, right? You're an S corp, 100% owned. Okay. So, so consider that in an ESOP transaction, an ESOP formation, the stock is held by a tax qualified trust. And uh, if it's a leveraged ESOP, which is a common structure, you know, the ESOP trust uh, will typically owe money to the company, which has taken a note in consideration for the stock that is transferred. The company makes contributions to the ESOP uh, each year in an amount, and this is a legal requirement, that is not less than the principal and interest that's due on the ESOP loan. That uh, company contribution to the ESOP is going to be tax deductible, as would a company's contributions to a pension plan or a 401k plan. Then, But isn't that limited, and isn't that the big knock against traditional ESOPs that you need a very broad employee base in order to be able to pay enough into the ESOP through the normal retirement contributions to amortize the debt? Could be. Uh, you know, there are certain caps on the amount of contributions, 25% uh, of total compensation for the eligible employees. And it, it's hard to sort of pinpoint a, a, a sweet spot for ESOPs in terms of its size. But for a number of reasons, it, it, it may be a good alternative for a company that has, well, let's say more than 30 employees and uh, certainly could be hundreds or thousands of employees. But let me just touch on that uh, smaller end of the scale and particularly in connection with S-Corps and, and fill out my answer to your question, Greg, on the, the advantages of forming an ESOP. So as we've discussed, a company's contributions to an ESOP uh, are tax deductible. But moreover, an S corporation can sponsor an ESOP. Now, of course, in an S corporation, you can't have more than 100 shareholders, but and, uh, the shareholders can be individuals or they can be a tax exempt trust, such as an ESOP. So, therefore, you know, an ESOP can be a shareholder of an S corporation. And if you have a corporation that is 100% owned by the ESOP, well then, the corporation is owned by a tax-exempt trust, and as a result, the company is basically going to have no taxes. Uh, All right, so hold on a second here. I want to make sure I understand that. That usually opens people's eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've now created a structure where I have a subchapter S, and I only have one shareholder. That shareholder is an ESOP trust. The ESOP trust is a qualified plan. When I realize profits inside of the S Corp, it doesn't matter whether I get a deduction or not. The profit flow through on the K-1 to the ESOP, and voila, there's no tax? Uh, yes, that's essentially how it works. What about well, unrelated business income tax? Is there an exception for that? Um, that can get a little bit more complicated. But I want to back up and just explain something in, in case the audience uh, could be easily uh, tripped up by some of these details. So when you have an ESOP, of course, the participants are the employees of the company. And every year, the eligible participants will receive an allocation of ESOP stock to their account. But so long as the stock is within the trust, the, the, the shareholder is the ESOP trust, and that's what Greg had referred to in saying that there's just one shareholder. And further, when a participant in the ESOP is eligible to receive a distribution, the company is not going to distribute actual shares for a number of reasons. It may be prohibited in the bylaws, and it may be that the company doesn't want uh, 
numerous people walking around with their shares. So instead, the ESOP or the company redeems the stock and then pays out cash to the employees. So I just wanted to clarify that, that the, the employees who participate in the ESOP will see in their account statements an allocation of stock, but that's uh, really just the, the record keeping within the plan, the shareholder remains the ESOP trust itself. So when an employee retires who's a participant in the ESOP, they have an, an account, as you said, it's like a defined contribution account. It has a value in it represented by shares of company stock, right? Um, but it's like any other distribution from a retirement plan. At that point, they will have taxable income as they receive distributions. That's correct. And their distributions are going to ordinary income as opposed to capital gain. Yes, that's also correct. However, they can roll it over, similar to a 401k into an IRA and to continue to defer that into so they're so they have and half start getting the required exactly. distribution. And they have the mandatory distribution. One thing that's really important to, that, that Paul touched about here is, and this was very uh, cumbersome for our employees to understand, is they did not get shares of stock. They got beneficial ownership in the company. In the, trust. Those, in the trust. So right. the shares that they were allocated were beneficial ownership in the trust. And, and it took a little while to get employees to realize that they didn't get a physical stock certificate, but they got a certificate that said these are your beneficial interests that you own. Right. Now, and so it's almost like a cash settled option, right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, I, I do want to circle back to uh, the comments that were made about the, the size of an ESOP and an important rule for S corporations is a provision under the Internal Revenue Code, Section 409, P, which uh, uh, w will limit the extent of allocations to certain disqualified individuals in the ESOP. And in a nutshell, what this means is if a participant in the ESOP has share allocations that are greater than 10% of the total or with family attribution is more than 20%, then the plan would fail this Internal Road Revenue Code Section 409P test, and the tax penalties can be onerous. So as a result, you kind of do the math. If you have an ESOP with 10 or fewer participants, you're, and it's an S-Corp, you're likely going to run into this problem. And for S-Corporation ESOPs with, you know, let's say 15 or 20 or 25 participants, they're going to need to look closely at this requirement from year to year to avoid the compliance failure. And another point I wanted to touch on following what Richard explained about distributions and shares is that the Internal Revenue Code allows an ESOP to impose certain restrictions on distributions that you don't see in 401k plans. So for example, an ESOP can provide for a general restriction on distributions until the acquisition loan that was used in an every, a leveraged ESOP to acquire the shares until that loan is paid off. And that could be 20 years down the road. But that's actually a good thing. That's a good thing. And the reason why the Internal Revenue Code allows that is that otherwise a company might be faced with kind of a run on its money uh, in the early stages after it, was, it formed an ESOP that could seriously disrupt the cash flows of the company. Now, just to uh, re relieve the fears that some people may have of uh, these restrictions on distributions, there are exceptions for people who hit normal retirement age, people who reach age 70 and a half and have required minimum distributions as they do under their 401k plan. And then there are other special uh, exceptions to that restriction, but it is a general restriction on distribution. But Rich, it's important that, you know, the ESOP essentially be remain live because if all the shares are allocated, then how do you attract new people, right? I mean, that so the, the, the calculation that, that uh, Paul spoke of of the principal and interest to determine the allocation of the shares uh, will tie to the amortization of the loan between the ESOP and the company. And in our case, we had a 20-year amortization, so our shares would not be fully allocated for 20 years, uh, which would cover a lot of us and then some. So uh, the reality is the shares are not fully allocated for 20 years because of the loan being in place. The other benefit that I would uh, add as a 
practitioner, not a practitioner, is that that loan became a very critical point for our company because there is an exclusion. So you're allowed to defer as an individual a maximum of, I think, $55,000 a year through HSA, 401K, Section 125. It's an aggregate limit. Aggregate limit. Our ESOP value was escalating at a very uh, high rate um, over the years, and the value that an employee was getting from the ESOP if we did, was greater than $55,000, would have put them over the limit. And because we had the loan in place, we had an exclusion, and I don't, you guys probably know the technical exclusion, and I don't, um, we were able to continue to allow people to put in their 401k, HSA, and use the Section 125 plan, which would, could have been disastrous in our company because the non-cash they were receiving in the ESOP and then the inability not to defer any in, uh, real uh, income uh, currently would have made people very unhappy. But the yeah. loan became a very uh, good thing for us because we were able to hide behind that. And yes, that's an important point. And part of and that, it's by design. That's yeah. what the loan is there for. Right. Yes, exactly right. Part of that too that it, that I think needs some emphasis is an explanation. So, uh, as Rich had implied, a company can sponsor both an ESOP and a 401k plan. And the reason why a company may want to have those two types of plans side by side include that an ESOP typically will not provide for any employee contributions. They're employer contributions only, and uh, usually it's available to all employees, and employees are not able to waive participation whereas a 401k plan might also be made available so that the employee can contribute his or her own money into the plan uh, and have it available for loans or, or what have you. And, uh, and again, as Richard said, nevertheless, if you sponsor more than one defined contribution plan, such as a 401k plan and an ESOP, there's a, a limit on what are called annual additions Pursuant to the Internal Revenue Code, currently that's $55,000 a year. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that limit. And, uh, and there are some additional amounts that can go in for what are called catch-up contributions. But what some companies face when they're doing really well, a good problem to have, is that the ESOP allocations combined with an employee's 401k contributions are coming up against that limit. So... Um Let's take a step back. To create one of these things, you know, you're looking at a firm that has at least 10 employees, ideally maybe 20, that has um, a, a compensation base that's broad enough that you know is not going to be completely bumped out by the maximum contribution limits, which are what 250 or 275 per year, right? Includable compensation, right? So if everybody's making 275, that's great. Or more, right? Because you're going to be capped out at 275. Um, but in order to get there, you have to restructure your current firm. So you're up in an LLC, and ESOP owning an LLC isn't going to work because that's going to be that's not going to get you the benefits of, that you want for tax purposes. And you need shares. You need, and they need to be shares. Stock. Correct. Yes. Got to be employer stock. And stock is defined by state law, not by IRS rules, I presume. So that means it has to be a corporation. And you want the S-Corp. Now, there's a peculiarity of the S-Corp statute that says you have to be an S-Corp for the entire year once you make the election, and you cannot have bad investors. Like, let's say you have a foreign investor who's ineligible to be a, a shareholder in an S-Corp. Um, they would have to be squeezed out by December 31st, assuming you're a calendar year taxpayer, of the prior year, so that on the first day of the year, you're pristine and clean, and everybody is an eligible shareholder, and then you make the S election, which can be retroactive if you do it by a certain time, and I think it's the, right. whatever, March 1st or whatever that date is. Um, but in order to clean it up, what we're often seeing is the need to do a hurry-up, squeeze-out merger and eliminate any of, of the pretenders to the equity, if you will, prior to the ESOP formation. Um, Rich, you pointed out that the value of your ESOP was going up so fast that without the debt, there would have been a problem under these contribution limits. So when you put the ESOP in five, six years ago? Six years, 2011. 
Yeah, the value of the firm was thirteen dollars and eight cents. and eight cents a share. Right. The second year it was thirteen dollars and seventy four cents. Forty four cents. The third year, uh, twenty seven dollars. Okay, so doubled in value in three years. Fourth year, uh, I think it was sixty seven. So a five times increase in value in four years. And then at the end of the fifth year? 83. Right. So you're seeing a, a, a continuing theme here. Now, attributable to reinvestment of money in the business, right? Correct. In your people, in new product, in expansion. Where did the money come from? Uncle Sam. So, I mean, quite frankly, I think the, the reality for our firm was in any asset manager firm, we don't have equipment, we don't have machinery that we're buying, so we can't go out and spend it on that. And at the end of every year, if you had a good year, you look at what you have and you say, I don't want to pay Uncle Sam, let's pay ourselves. You comp it out and bonus, and you move on. You don't put any money away for a rainy day. And so for us, what we were trying to do is grow the firm, stop paying Uncle Sam, and uh, we were able to uh, put a very good comp package in place for everybody with variable uh, compensation uh, bonus arrangements that moved as the market moved. So. We would not get hurt. Uh, only as it went up, everyone did well, and uh, we were able to put money away for a rainy day. In the case of 2001, 2008, uh, we had cash, and also to reinvest in the business, hire more people, buy acquire new product, acquire, right. So it essentially gave you the ability to have a war chest, right. And just so we're clear, it's not that Uncle Sam doesn't get paid; they get paid later. It's a deferral mechanism. Correct. And it also forecloses capital treatment, so it's going to be ordinary income on the back end. So it's a deferral and an increase in rate, but nevertheless, in the short term, enable the firm to significantly increase the value of the firm Correct. by reinvestment in the firm. Um, now, people say, I could do the same thing by going to a private equity firm or to a bank. The problem with both of those strategies is you're using after-tax dollars to repay the bank or to give the private equity firm its share, and those after-tax dollars have to come from somewhere. Now, if you do it properly, maybe you'll have some depreciation or amortization expenses to offset income. It's not quite the same thing as when you don't have to worry about the tax man at all, which is what this structure is designed to do. So. Um, if we go to slide number um, 16, leveraged ESOPs, Paul, you mentioned the, the, the debt component. Tell us a little bit about the extent to which um, the ESOP can use leverage. It's 100%, right? Correct. And so the way in which, well, let's say 100% uh, leveraged ESOP would be structured is that, uh, again, the, the ESOP trust would take out a loan, uh, often in structured whereby the, the company is essentially giving... Hey, time out. A loan from whom? Yes. The loan could be from, uh, the, from the company that sponsors the ESOP. It could be from the shareholders who are selling the stock... In the form of an installment sale. Yes. So seller financing by the employees. Yes. And that could be a 20-year note. Correct. Uh, or sometimes a, a company will get outside financing uh, for the ESOP loan. Now, Rich, in your particular case, you did a combination of all of those things, right? You had right. some uh, internal bank debt or internal company debt. You had seller financing through um, long-term purchases, and you also had bank debt. So how did that all work out? So essentially the, the, um, what we did is we looked at, and it was, mathematically what we were paying uh, in taxes out each year <laughs> and did a uh, calculation of what seven years would that be in principal and interest over seven years and that's what we went to the bank and borrowed and then the difference, the delta of the valuation was a shareholders took uh, a note, a 20 year note. And so... And how did that impact the cash flow of the business? <laughs> There was a neutral, there was no zero impact to cash on the business because we were already distributing the money to pay taxes and we just said distributing the money to pay tax, we paid bank. <coughs> so we had a zero impact to cash flow. And your reinvestment capital is the delta between the bank debt and the growth of the business. That's exactly right. <coughs> and to the extent you can reinvest in the business and grow it, 
get that much um, greater opportunity. Excuse me, everybody. I'm sort of losing my voice here. <coughs> um, okay. Now, obviously, it's not all um, flowers and cherries. I mean, there are some restrictions and limitations, one of the most important of which is you need to have an independent trustee. Correct. And, uh, yes, before we get carried away with all the uh, tax advantages of ESOPs, as we mentioned at the outset, <coughs> you have to bear in mind that at its essence, an ESOP is a tax-qualified retirement plan and subject to rules and scrutiny from the IRS and the Department of Labor. And so in forming an ESOP, uh, uh, best practices would be to start with the appointment of a trustee. Now, a couple of factors to keep in mind for the trustee. The, uh, the trustee should be, of course, independent from the company and its uh, shareholders. The trustee should ideally be a professional trustee or an institutional trustee. And the trustee will need to have discretion in the ESOP transaction. So in the ESOP transaction, but also, as you say on slide 21, with respect to sales to third parties. Exactly. So uh, this, of course, is because the, the ESOP trust is going to own the shares and the ESOP trustee will have fiduciary duties to the employees who participate in the ESOP. And so the, the trustee is going to follow the requirements under ERISA for uh, uh, several matters concerning the ESOP. The most important one is the valuation of the stock. And that's probably step two in the ESOP formation process. So. You, you appointed a trustee, and, and by the way, that is an appointment that should be conducted outside of the uh, discretion or decision of the selling shareholders. Now you have an independent and preferably professional or, or institutional trustee. That trustee will then go out and engage an independent appraiser. <clears throat> independent appraiser has a special meaning under ERISA and an ESOP will need to have an independent appraiser and an independent appraisal of the company stock throughout the life of the ESOP. But in the initial ESOP stock purchase transaction, the trustee will engage an independent appraiser. And to emphasize something right there, it's the trustee that engages the appraiser, not the company, even though the company pays for it. And the independent appraiser Nobody pays for everything, right? <laughs> right? The independent appraiser will report solely and exclusively and confidentially to the trustee. The appraiser will go in and, of course, receive extensive diligence from the company in order to perform the valuation. But at the end of the independent appraiser's process for the initial transaction, they'll provide a report to the trustee that will never be shared with the company or the selling shareholders, and that will lead to the offer and acceptance process uh, in the ESOP stock transaction. Then in subsequent years after the ESOP is formed, the trustee will continue to engage an independent appraiser. You might change appraisers, appraisers from year to year, but after the in this initial ESOP transaction, the appraiser's report will not be confident. So, okay, this is all well and good, but let's say that the parties decide that they either want to bring on a distribution partner or they want to expand the business or they want to go to the next generation and they want to exit the ESOP. Um, on slide 24, I asked the obvious question, but why would you want to exit the ESOP? <clears throat> and if you do, you have to think about um, essentially buying out a retirement plan, whatever that fair value is. Correct. And once you buy it out, the cash goes into the allocated accounts of the employees, and they would turn it over to an IRA, presumably, or go into distribution status. Yes. Okay. Now, there's another option, which is you keep the ESOP in place, keep the S-Corp in place, and you create a joint venture underneath where whoever your equity partner is is coming in, and the equity partner effectively buys uh, interest in a joint venture from the uh, S-Corp. So your tax planning structure stays in place. 
your accounts for your employees stay in place. All of those tax benefits that you get stay in place, but we create a new joint venture entity that's an LLC, partnership flow through, and we contribute the operating business to that joint venture. So if you look at the slides that begin on slide number 26, um, the shareholders essentially would create a new structure. We're going to convert that target into an LLC. And when all is said and done, if you turn over to slide number 29, um, you end up with a joint venture, which is the new LLC, tax as a partnership. You have your private equity fund or bank or whoever, that's the triangle off on the right, owning a piece of that LLC, the operating entity. And you still have your shareholder, namely the ESOP, and your S-Corp as the continued owner of whatever percentage of that business that you would have. Rich, you guys recently went through a transaction very similar to this, did you not? Absolutely. Looks quite familiar. And the, the structure you ended up with is a private equity firm owning a portion of the operating business, but the employees and everyone else remains an employee of the ESOP through a secondment arrangement with the operating business, correct? correct. So, again, structures like these are possible. They allow you to avoid the closeout of the ESOP and the funding that would be required, but nevertheless continue to maintain the integrity of the ESOP because, at least in this structure, all of the people who work in this business are still employees of the employer, in quotes, that's sponsoring the ESOP. Yeah. So, <clears throat> with that background <laughs> and all the legal structures, what I'd like to do now is, is uh, turn to our guest from Barclays, who's going to walk us through a couple of uh, equity recycling case studies and then we're going to talk about some market multiples for your exit strategies. Um, you know, the question we always get is, is it bigger than a bread box? So tell us about some of the uh, case studies that you've been working on in terms of equity recycling. Sure. Thanks, Rick. Um, so uh, what I'd like to start with is a recently announced transaction um, in the form of the uh, restructuring of OZ management, which is formerly OXIF. Uh, management, publicly traded hedge fund um, founded by Danny Ock. Um, so the, the transaction which was announced about 10 days or so ago um, really contemplated three key uh, elements. One was an equity realignment, which we'll touch on in a second. The second of which was sort of a balance sheet uh, restructuring and, and an acceleration of, of debt pay down. And the third of which was a C-Corp um, conversion from, from their existing partnership. Um, so going back to the, 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 the most important uh, piece, uh, was, which was the equity realignment, what was the problem? The problem was, was a couplefold. One was um, the existing partners at the time, uh, well, the existing partners today uh, do not have um, pre this transaction didn't really have any equity in the game. Um, so they didn't have any skin, um, you know, in the game and, and as a result felt like they were working for uh, the original founders who at um, the time of the IPO continued to own a significant uh, majority of, of the business um, and, uh, and had never really contemplated an equity recycling program. Um, and so as as the generations uh, shifted and as people started to retire, there became uh, an increasingly large problem uh, around uh, the total cost base of the business as new people became partners and as people uh, grew and as their salaries increased, um, such did the, you know, the cost structure in the business and, and that sunsetting off of, of the prior ownership and the units held by the prior ownership um, was never really contemplated. So what ended up happening in the form of this transaction was the existing A unit holders, which were the, the founding shareholders of the business, gave up 35% of their, their units, um, their A units, uh, for a give up in compensation from the existing executive managing director, directors um, and uh, into perpetuity effectively. So they're going to give up that comp basically forever for the benefit of that 35% um, economics. 
they, uh, they being the current executive managing directors, are going to now become the largest shareholders in the uh, OXIF, pro forma OXIF group. So, um, you know, holistically, um, you know, what we're seeing is, as a benefit of, of this deal is that, you know, as part of this sort of realignment, people are feeling a lot better about sort of how we as the existing management group um, can be motivated and and um, and excited about creating value um, in the equity and in the stock going forward because now they're aligned not only with the retired folks but they're also re uh, aligned with um, the public shareholders. So when you boil it down, what you had was sort of a combination of uh, Caitlin's compensatory equity being shifted from an older generation to the new managing director or senior executive staff uh, in exchange for contribution in, and that contribution in was therefore gone salary. Correct. And and so and the important thing to you know to note note there as well is that you know as part of this as part of this holistic restructuring, you know the the existing management also wanted to ensure that the business was was sort of well structured into the future. And so what that also meant and what it also contemplated was a an acceleration the pay down of debt and the acceleration of of sort of restructuring of the balance sheet because they also wanted to ensure that the business was aligned properly on, on the balance, balance sheet side of the equation such that over time as economics grew and as the business um, improves, um, that, their, you know, that their equity is, is obviously increasingly, um, increasingly valuable and, um, and growing um, in a way that they, you know, that they think is uh, appropriate for what they traded off, which was ultimately that comp. Now, so Caitlin, did they have to do an 83 when they would do an 83? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was going to ask something similar in that the, the recycling of the um, equity from the older generation and new generation, how was, was that just kind of like a white elephant exchange or was there, you know, some employee communication or holdouts was there? Was that kind of, what, what was that process? Yeah, I mean, tax people are probably better placed to answer that than I am, but um, to, to the best of my understanding, the way that it works is that the profit interest in the business remains with um, the existing unit holders. Mm -hmm. um, so they're effectively giving them economic units until those units book up in the future. The, the existing profits interest for those units, because they're 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 going into what's called and we don't need to go into all the nuances, but into what's called a distribution holiday for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Those profits interests will continue to remain with the uh, the the retired um, uh, managing directors um, until those profit until those profits interests ultimately book up mm -hmm. into a a share um, over time. So there's no tax implications day one. So this sort of goes back to the uh, discussion we had early on with a grant of an equity interest. If it has no value on the date of grant, you would file an 83B in order to set the value at zero okay. in a taxable exchange. And it sounds as if the new members are essentially getting future growth right. after the distribution holiday. Correct. <clears throat> so that would further defer the current value for the period of the distribution holiday because they're not getting that. And so, therefore, the value of their interest would be lower. And it's only, and again, ta getting back to the taxable question, it's only taxable upon that book up and upon um, the, the moment at which it turns into a unit post, post the holiday. Now, the important thing also to keep in mind here in, in these structures and in the couple of case studies that Rick's going to walk us through is these are zero-sum games. There's only so many dollars on the table, right? And in Rich's case, they were able to use the the tax deferrals that are presented by the ESOP structure to take those dollars that would otherwise be spent to pay them and use them for debt service and also to reinvest in the business. In this case, the, um, the current management team forewent salary, so therefore those dollars are left in the business, and also there is a distribution holiday. So again, we're using the chips that are on the table in order to refinance That's the funny. equity. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, 
Very important lesson to keep in mind, each of these transactions are zero-sum games. If you bring in an outside party, like a private equity firm or a bank, they need to be repaid. And so just like any other uh, financing structure, unless it's internal, those structures will require you to have cash flow budgets and use that cash flow to amortize the debt over time. Uh, I guess the, the me message there is there is no free lunch, right? But as, as Rich's situation proves out, um, properly structured, the increase in value can be substantial, the enterprise value of the firm, because of the reinvestment in the firm, the pay down of debt, and also the expansion of the, the product lines and the people. So, um, so tell us about uh, equity recycling case firm one. Yeah, sure. So um, there's two case studies I'd like to touch on. One is firm one. Um, the first, the first of which, um, you know, I think it's a relatively straightforward program that they put in place. So they put in the, put this program in place later in their evolution. They were founded in the '60s, but the program really was only um, uh, sort of put uh, put into action in the late '90s. Um, the way it works is it's a four four year four-year sunset um, in the management company. So effectively, that's the cash flows in the management company itself. Um, the second piece of the equation is carry participation. And I think, and we'll touch upon that again in the next case study. But the way that that works is their carry participation for uh, two funds um, remain in place and basically linearly drop off as, those, as, uh, as each fund is put into uh, into effect or is the money is, is gone to work. So the way that it would, you know, let's just use some numbers. Uh, if they had 10% in, in, uh, in fund one, the next fund they would have is, you know, 5% or something along those lines. And then in the, in the third fund, they would have zero. Um, this is a very traditional structure, by the way, for real estate management firms that have multiple funds over time with different back-end vintages for employees. Not something you could do, for example, in a registered fund firm like um, Emerald that has primarily um, registered mutual funds and large separate accounts where back-end participation is, you know, not as easily created. And I think that's consistent around most of these case studies we have. Most of them are alternative asset management firms, private equity firms, real estate firms, uh, infrastructure firms, things like that that have larger portions of back-end participation. Um, the, the next case study is firm three. Um, this one's a little bit different. There's no management company participation after a partner or, or our principal lease. Um, there's no real sunsetting, so to speak, for, for that piece of, of the cash flow stream. Um, there is, however, a, a retention by that individual in, in their sort of vested carry interest. And so they will m m retain that, but they will not retain any future participation in carry in any funds that will come post their retirement. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about some um, market multiples, you know, again, is it bigger than a spread box and the key themes that you're seeing. Obviously, we've seen massive uh, gyrations in the value of the equity markets, especially the public equity markets, um, with a big run-up from last November until, say, May. And then since May, we've had a significant downturn where now we're deemed to be in correction, although today there's a big bounce in the Dow. So what's happened to market multiple? Yeah, sure. So, you know, quickly, um, the way to think about it in, in for publicly traded asset managers um, they're trading right now at, at an all-time low relative to, you know, really a five-year five year or, or really full historic average. Um, you know, we're talking about multiples in sort of the 10x type range for a forward PE. Um, now, it's important to sort of then juxtapose that with what you see in private setting, where multiples for M&A deals um, have remained pretty constant um, and pretty flat, I'd say, over the last five-ish years. Um, we're seeing multiples for uh, an average across all transactions of being around 10 times um, EBITDA, and that's normally priced off of run rate EBITDA, which means 
um, you know, existing asset assets which are in the ground today at the time of the transaction um, annualized um, and adjusted for uh, for compensation and, and expenses. Just to put this in historical context, when I was um, EVP running an M&A department for an asset management shop out of London um, between 1999 and 2002, our average multiple was, get this, 20 to 22 of EBITDA. Well, <laughs> often forward priced. So we're talking about go-go markets, go-go pricing, and um, very, very different world. Than, um, the good old days. The good old days, exactly. Um, so key themes. What are we seeing in terms of acquisition multiples for you know, traditional equity shops, for uh, alternative asset shops, for you know, what, sure. what you're seeing in the marketplace. Yeah, sure. So um, our, in the last page in, you know, in, 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 our, in our slide deck touches a little bit on sort of themes of, of transactions and where they're, you know, where they're coming from. Um, the first three themes are really um, buyer themes, and the last theme is, is a supply side theme, um, where is, you know, where are deals coming from or where are the assets coming from. The first of which is consolidation and, and focus on costs. You know, you're seeing a lot of um, asset managers who are under pressure um, from a, a number of different reasons, whether it be fees, costs, distribution issues, et cetera. So what's your normal erosion rate when you're doing a consolidation for costs in terms of clients leaving, uh, being put on watch lists, and otherwise being frozen breakage. out, breakage essentially yeah. from the acquisition? Yeah, breakage, I mean, it, it really depends. It's situational depending on how much overlap we see in, in a deal. Uh, we average when we do, do our own modeling somewhere between 10 to 15 percent, um, but that's for a business that doesn't have huge amounts of overlap and huge amounts of, um, uh, you know, basically product concentrations that are similar. So, Rich, when you did your deal, um, you needed to go out obviously and get a proxy with the mutual funds. How long did that take to get to the uh, necessary 50.1 percent? Uh, four months. Four months, yes. and that's with a proxy solicitor and with a fairly friendly the shareholder pro base. Proxy solicitor, fairly friendly, and all hands on deck, all the, calling everybody to get the votes in. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was over the summertime. Yeah, the uh, rule change that went into effect about ten years ago with the SEC that eliminated so-called broker vote, um, which was intended to be a shareholder populist vote, but it's just backfired horribly because it's impossible to find shareholders in order to get them to vote because you own omnibus accounts and even though the brokers cooperate and you get the information, it's still virtually impossible to get these people to, to, to act. And uh, that means transactions that should happen to make all the economic sense in the world tend to get stymied. So, you know, if anything should be changed, they should go back to the broker vote because, you know, from the point of view of shareholder populist voting, it really doesn't work. But uh, having si having said that, um, so I'm sorry. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, no, and then you know, look, just very quickly on the last couple of themes. You know, I think we're seeing a lot in the way of minority stakes today. I think there's a lot of capital chasing uh, minority stake opportunities. There's been dedicated pools of capital, dedicated funds, which have been raised um, to take minority stakes in, in in funds, many of which are private equity funds or hedge funds. So that's alternative asset managers again. Um, and they're taking a minority stake in the general partner or advisor typically, entity. Typically in the general partner, um, and they'll take a, a, a share in the economics of uh, the management fee portion of the company as well as the carry. carry. Um, the, the share, the percentage that they normally acquire is 20% is or below, typically, um, again, across both sleeves. Um, and then there's, you know, the last, the last theme here on the buyer side is alternative platform deals, um, and that's Again, alternative asset management businesses, whether it be private equity firms, hedge funds, real estate infrastructure, um, real assets more, more broadly, um, uh, selling or finding homes inside of uh, larger, more diversified asset management businesses. Um, sometimes those asset management businesses sit inside of insurance companies, so insurance embedded asset managers or banks. Um, and really the genesis and reason they're looking for that is, is diversification. And, uh, the opportunity to find yield and yieldy products for um, ultimately their end clients. Okay, we have about 30 seconds. Any, you know, 
concluding comments from the uh, from the audience here. Paul. Oh, thanks, Greg. So, yes, we've discussed a pretty wide range of uh, certain aspects of uh, exit strategies and uh, ways in which they can actually be integrated. I, th I think you know ESOP companies that that also have forms of equity-based compensation for their executives, uh, but uh, SARs, for example. Sure. Yes. For exactly. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, what I would just uh, end with is. Beware of the traps for the unwary on fiduciary requirements. Kayla. Um, well, it sounds like from all the presentations that a holistic, comprehensive approach to equity compensation, um, as well as deferring for your retirement, all of that is important. N none of the options should be skipped or overlooked. And very few of them are mutually exclusive. A lot of them work together as, you know, we showed with Rich, who had SARs, who had an ESOP plan, and now is part owned by a private equity firm, the operating business, not the ESOP, um, and still generating value right, all the way across the board. So again, it can be done. And Rick? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think thematically all of these trends and the drivers of why people are, are needing to do something or facilitate equity realignment or, or, or some form of equity restructuring will continue to be a driver of, of asset management activity um, and asset management M&A um, uh, more broadly. I would say, Greg, that one of the things that if anyone listening, the folks listening, uh, you can hear from the, the folks in the room here, uh, the Pepper folks and, and, and Rick, I would urge a, a strong team. I mean, having folks like Pepper on our side through the process that are creative, Having folks like Barclays on your side that are that are out there doing the, doing this work uh, is invaluable. And, and if you're going to do any of these transactions, assemble the best team first, and then go. Because without that team, you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to conquer and and, and succeed. And Pepper was extremely influential in us uh, being successful. And I'm sure Rick, you're the same for your clients as well. But I would strongly urge assembling the best team first before you proceed. Well, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Caitlin.